Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers Presidential Address for 2020. The address will start imminently. Before it starts, let me just give you a bit of the statistics for this webinar. We have a total of 330 people that have registered to view this webinar. Of those currently online, we have about 158. And the number still continues to go up. This is the second of the online webinars that we're doing for this year in light of the lockdown that's been imposed by the state president. And we as the SAE are making the most of the situation as it is because we cannot, uh, or rather gatherings of more than 100 people are not allowed at this point in time. Having said that and given you those uh, statistics, let me do my official notes for the webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, as I have bade you good morning, my name is Leonid Matutuani and I will be your host for the morning. In order to get the most out of your attendance of this session or webinar, take note of the following. Please ensure you have a stable internet connection that is at least capable of supporting live streaming. In order for the webinar to run as smoothly as possible, please ensure that you are using headphones or have eliminated all background noise. It is recommended that attendees utilize Google Chrome or Firefox to run GoToWebinar. These browsers have proven to be the most reliable with this platform. Attendees will not be able to chat to each other. They will only be able to speak by using the questions area and the questions appear to the presenters or organizers. Questions are not seen by other attendees, only by the presenters or organizers. The questions will publish for all attendees to see only once they have been answered inside the GoToWebinar platform. Attendees can speak over the microphone. However, the organizer or co-organizer must unmute the attendee's microphone. An attendee will need to utilize the raise hand functionality if they would like to speak. Panelists or organizers will be able to chat to each other via the chat box. However, it does not appear to regular attendees. The webinar control area has different drop downs for the different areas of the webinar, that is, chat, questions, etc. To view one of those sections, there are two options to utilize. Either one expands or contract via the arrow for that section, or pop out, which is a square with an arrow pointing out of it, which will show the section box separate from the rest of the sections in its own window. When one presenter is finished speaking, they must mute their microphone so no background noise will be heard while the other presenters speak. This webinar has videos as part of the presentation. Please be patient during switchovers between the presentation and videos. And with those few pointers out of the way, let me call upon the Vice President of the South African Institute of Engineers, Professor Sunil Maharaj, to conduct the official welcoming. Professor Maharaj, the platform is yours. Thank you, our host and program director, Mr. Matutawane. Madam President, Ms. Sai Gaura, office bearers, council members, South African Institute of Electrical Engineers CEO and their leadership team, SAIE members and attendees at large. Good morning and welcome to our 2020 presidential address. This is a momentous occasion in the history of the SAREE. For it's the first time we are doing this presidential address fully online. Please allow me to introduce to all of you our president, Ms. Sa Gura. 
Saigura has been part of the energy industry in South Africa for over 25 years. She started her career as a consultant and later was appointed as the city electrical engineer for East London. Currently, she is the general manager for the power system division within Acton. In this role, she leads the division that is responsible for the designs and execution of turnkey projects, substations and projects ranging from 6.6 kV to 400 kV. Our president also holds a number of qualifications, including a Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical and Electronics, a Master's in Business Administration, and a Government Certificate of Competency. Ms. Gura has also served as the president of the Association of Municipal Municipal Utilities from 2008 to 2010, and has been on the AMEU Council from 2001 until 2011. She was the first female president of the AMEU. She was instrumental in changing the AMEU constitution to introduce more women on the executive, thus paving the way for the next female president. She's a fellow of the SAIEE and since 2012 has been serving as a council member of the SAIEE. SAI has chaired the professional development and finance committees and actively participates in various other committees. She recently launched the SAIEE Women in Engineering chapter, which will strive to promote women interests and champion empowerment programs within the SAIEE and broader electrical engineering fraternity. Ms. Gura is a registered member with the Engineering Council of South Africa as a professional engineer and was an active volunteer at EXA, having served as the chairperson of the Engineering Program Accreditation Committee. She's an international accreditor for engineering programs within the Washington Accord signatory countries and participated in the accreditation of South African university programs. She was also part of the advisory team to the deputy president on the ESKIM turnaround strategy in 2014. It's also very pertinent that Ms. Gura is the third female president of the SAIEE and also the first female of color to be the president of the SAIEE. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce the topic our president will address us on this morning. The topic of our president's address today is entitled the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution along with its disruptive technologies focuses on the digital economy which is evolving rapidly. The application of artificial intelligence commonly known as AI and big data is triggering the explosion of better processing capabilities. Every industry is embedding AI into their products or services and is increasing at a rapid pace. The speed of the current industrial revolution indicates that a possible fifth industrial revolution might be sooner than we expect. Every industrial revolution has improved human life, but will the fifth, the fifth industrial revolution is meant to scale a thousand times that of the 4IR. The convergence of technology and humans is catapulting us into the fourth industrial revolution. This address discusses the era of the fifth IR, the possibilities in the age of AI, machines performing human tasks, innovation and inclusivity. So Africans are more willing to engage with the robotics and AI as per surveys undertaken by PricewaterhouseCoopers than our counterparts in the UK, Germany, or Sweden. Health, electric cars, driverless cars known as autonomous vehicles, education, 3D printing, and the increase in the density of robot workers are all evolving. The address will also cover current developments of humanoids, 
development in drones, wearable internet, supercomputers, and the data explosion forecast to reach zettabytes by 2025, which is equivalent to a billion terabytes. The address provokes the endless possibilities for the SAIEE and the engineering sector as a whole, with AI, robotics, IoT, big data, automation, smart systems, machine learning, and humans striving to achieve unlimited innovations into the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome <coughs> our president, Masai Gura, to present her presidential address 2020. Thank you, Deputy President, Professor Sunil Maharaj. Good morning to everyone, especially our members and esteemed guests from all over South Africa and the world. It is indeed a pleasure for me to host you for our first webinar-based presidential address. I had looked at the option of actually using a bot or an avatar to do my inaugural speech, but although many thought this is a far-fetched idea, I could not hire one at a reasonable rate. So you guys are stuck with me for today, but in future, I am sure that most of the presidential addresses will actually be done by a bot or an avatar. So my presidential address today is with regard to the fifth industrial revolution. In terms of the content, I'll be covering why the fifth industrial revolution, the era of the fifth industrial revolution, the possibilities in the age of artificial intelligence, what are the current advances? And in particular, I'm going to be touching on eight different areas, and each one of these areas is a speech on its own. So I'm just going to be very brief in terms of what I cover. So firstly, I'll be covering solar cells, drones, the data explosion, nanotechnologies, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, humanoid robots, supercomputers, and how does AI pave the way for virtual power plants? And how does it help with the current crisis that we are under? What are the risks that we face? What does the future look like? And my conclusion. So firstly, why the fifth industrial revolution? And what I'm going to be doing is people have often asked me, so are we only in the fourth industrial revolution? Why are you talking about the fifth industrial revolution? So by giving a brief history in terms of how long each of these industrial revolutions took place, you will see that the different um, time between the different industrial revolutions drastically reduces. So the first one took place between 1760 and 1850, lasting about 90 years and mainly mechanization. The second one took place between 1863 and 1947, lasting 84 years, mainly electrification. The third was somewhere between 1969 and 2000, covering approximately 31 years automation. The fourth is currently underway. As you can see, the evolution of technology is accelerating. And the speed of the industrial revolutions indicate that a possible fifth industrial revolution might be sooner than we actually are expecting. So while we all hooked on our cell phones, especially now that we're under the lockdown, the machines are learning. So I'll be touching later on what machine learning is all about as well. So what is the era of the fifth industrial revolution? So the fourth industrial revolution is all about digital transformation, which was the immediate past president's theme last year. The fifth industrial revolution is meant to scale a thousand times that of the fourth in speed, in technology, in the rapid explosion of innovation. And it's also the rapid convergence of technology and humans. And it's catapulting us to the fifth industrial revolution, which is basically the era of artificial intelligence. Cyber systems are linked by networks that create smart autonomous factories, which lead to smart cities and smart devices. So what are the possibilities in the age of artificial intelligence? Firstly, is it about machines actually performing all the tasks that are done by humans? You have chatbots, you have Sophia, you have Erica, you have avatars, there's millions of these. But later on, I'll be showing you a video on an avatar by Neon and a chatbot called Sophia. 
artificial intelligence, super intelligence, or the launch of artificial super intelligence exceeds that of human intelligence is also known as singularity. Machine learning is the new buzzword and is cited as the most important modern business trend to drive success. In a study that was done by PwC, 82% of South Africans are willing to engage with robotics and AI and are prepared to rely on technology. The reason why I'm actually saying this is that most countries are opposed to the implementation of robots because they've got the fear, the fear of the unknown, the fear of losing their jobs. So there's a lot of resistance in a lot of the first world countries. Interestingly, South Africa's ratio of industrial robots to employees is amongst the top global 40. I'm showing you now a graph that indicates that South Africa is amongst some of the top countries that are actually willing to engage with AI and robotics, in particular with regard to healthcare, and are not that resistant to change. In this particular graph, you will see that there is a high density of robots in a lot of countries. And this graph was actually uh, updated in 2017. So if anyone can find me a newer graph, I'd really appreciate it. And I think the reason is people are very wary now to indicate that they're actually exploding in terms of the number of robots that they are employing in their companies. If you take, for example, iPhone and Amazon, they've replaced tens of thousands of factory jobs with robots. And this is what people are scared of. What are our current advances? So we've got Internet of Things, um, mainly creating a super intelligent society. I asked one of my kids, uh, what does he think about artificial intelligence? And he was like, he's got a microcomputer called Arduino, used for programming. I'm like, what do you, how do you even know about this? And he's like, well, YouTube, Google mom. So kids are getting super intelligent. They can't, we can't even keep up with them at this stage. Wearable internet. And I'm not just talking about those steps or step counters and getting to your discovery targets. I'm talking about heartbeat rates, BMI, blood pressure monitor, oxygen levels. Currently, we're looking at ECG on your wrist. And with, with your watches, your arteries are basically below a certain level of the surface. So people are even advancing to try and have devices on your finger, which gets to your arteries at a better distance. And these are rings. The latest ring that everyone's talking about is Aurora. 3D printing and manufacturing. One of the most expensive supply chains in the world is to try and send stuff to space. When something breaks down, they need to send a spare part or they need to have replacement items on the spaceships. They've now changed this entire concept by having a 3D printer on board. 3D printing has been printing jet engines to apartments, to circuit boards, to prosthetics, and it used to be very pricey, but it's all coming down now. And we've got our own University of Johannesburg that's currently printing face shields, and we commend them on that. You have smart systems, be it electrical, home, industrial, commercial. You can now fit your clothes digitally and order online. And especially ladies that order from Wish will understand this. By the time your clothes arrive, they don't fit. I don't know if we put on weight by the time they arrive, but now you can actually fit them on digitally, make sure that it fits properly and then order them. A lot of you might have seen the video on the memory mirror. So you go to a shop, you try on different outfits. It keeps a memory of what you've tried on. You are able to actually send these pictures and videos to your friends and decide on which outfit you actually want to wear for that spe special occasion. You've got glass fiber cables that transport a great deal of data. So in particular that I just want to go a little bit in depth and to show you what is available out there, I'm going to firstly start with solar cells. So this is what a tiny little solar cell looks like. It's basically glass that can shift non-visible light to a solar panel using phosphor materials in the glass. So what happens is visible light is let through and ultraviolet and infrared rays are redirected to a small solar panel on the side. 
So you could have entire buildings looking like this, all covered with solar panes. Drones. I'm going to be showing you two videos now. The first one is a US company called Zipline, which is using drones to deliver medical supplies in Africa, mainly Rwanda and Tanzania. This is a complete transformation in traditional logistics con consisting of autonomous navigation systems. What happens is when you switch on your cell phone and your ways, it takes quite a while for your GPS to actually connect. So what they've done is they've kept the GPS inside the battery unit so that it's always connected. It delivers critical life-saving products to exactly where and when they're needed across many countries, be it blood or vaccines. They have to date delivered about 34,000 packages. And the reason for this mainly is that you can't get to some of these areas because of the bad infrastructure in terms of roads, et cetera. The second video that I'm going to be showing you is with regard to a solar plane called Aurora Odysseus, which is one that is used to fly in high altitudes, mainly the stratosphere, and is used for intelligence and surveillance. Because we could only load five videos, I've combined these two videos, so you will see them differentiated just with a black screen in between. So the first one will be the zip line, and the second one will be the solar plane. So if you just hold on for it to just quickly load. Okay. Since we started operating our first system in Rwanda more than a year ago now, We've been designing our next generation system from the ground up, incorporating all that experience of that first operation. And so we've re redesigned uh, pretty much everything about the plane and our ground systems to support scaled operations. So instead of being able to do 50 flights a day, we want to be able to do 500 flights a day from a single distribution center. We pull the blood or the medical product for that order, put it in a package, put that package into a zip, and launch that zip. Controller ready, airspace is clear, slight headwind. The aircraft weighs 20 kilograms, about 40, 45 pounds. Copy, spinning motors and launching the plane 138. Uh, it has about a 10 foot wingspan, three meters, uh, and it can carry uh, about three pounds, 1.75 kilograms. The plane is measuring actively the wind speed and the direction. And so if the wind's blowing in a particular direction, it's going to compensate and drop that package so it lands on the ground right where you want it. Uh, we can hit an area about the size of two parking spots. It looks like a kind of like a cake box with a paper parachute on top. A fixed wing aircraft can fly dramatically farther than something like a quadcopter. And that's really important for what we do. It can fly faster. It can fly through heavier weather. And the approaches to things like safety are also much easier. On our aircraft, for example, we have multiple motors, right? Uh, the plane, if either one of those stops working, the plane flies just fine. We're in Rwanda today, and we're expanding to cover the other half of Rwanda uh, as we speak, and next is Tanzania. From there, we are really focused on solving this problem, access to medical products at a global scale. There's access to medical product problems in the US and in the developing world, and we really want to solve all of those problems everywhere.
So the next video that I'm going to be showing you is with regard to drone weaponry. So this uses basically facial recognition, GPS, um, being investigated in defense, military departments. And if you think that the level of control is an experienced pilot, it's actually not. It's a swarm of converging technologies, mainly an explosion of machine learning, 3D printing, and a breakthrough material science. It looks also into a possible future. And the scary thing is hopefully not a misapplication of drones. This video was screened in 2017 to the UN Convention on Conventional Weapons Meeting in Geneva. So I'm just going to be loading this one. There might be a slight delay. Customer pilots directed almost 3,000 precision strikes last year. We're super proud of it. It allows you to separate the bad guys from the good. It's a big deal. But we have something much bigger. Your kids probably have one of these, right? Not quite. Hell of a pilot? No. That skill is all AI. It's flying itself. Its processor can react a hundred times faster than a human. The stochastic motion is an anti-sniper feature. Just like any mobile device these days, it has cameras and sensors, and just like your phones and social media apps, it does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shaped explosive. This is how it works. Did you see that? That little bang is enough to penetrate the skull and destroy the contents. They used to say guns don't kill people. People do. Well, people don't. They get emotional. Disobey orders, aim high. Let's watch the weapons make the decisions. Now trust me, these were all bad guys. Now that is an airstrike of surgical precision. It's one of a range of products. Trained as a team, they can penetrate buildings, cars, trains, Evade people, bullets, pretty much any countermeasure. They cannot be stopped. Now, I said this was big. Why? Because we are thinking big. Watch. A $25 million order now buys this. Enough to kill half a city. The bad half. Nuclear is obsolete. Take out your entire enemy, virtually risk-free. Just characterize him, release the swarm, and rest easy. Dumb weapons drop where you point them. Smart weapons consume data. When you can find your enemy using data, even by a hashtag, you can target an evil ideology right where it starts. So moving on, one of the next advances is the data explosion. So what is data explosion all about? It's large amounts and volumes of data and storage. The first thing that's actually causing this is big data and internet of, of things, devices, mainly sensors. It's actually predicted that we'll have close to 500 billion sensors by 2025. AI and machine learning analyzes a lot of data, and this is also creating an, an data explosion. You have things like blockchain, virtual reality, cloud cloud-based computing, 
all causing data explosion. Which brings us to the zettabyte era. So what is a zettabyte? It's actually a measure of storage capacity and it's about 10 to the power of 21 bytes. Out of interest, it took 40 years to reach a global zettabyte, but it won't take that long to get to two zettabytes. I.O. devices alone create close to 90 zettabytes of data by 2025. It is estimated that 175 zettabytes will be consumed by 2025. The US is obviously expecting this uh, explosion and it's already investing close to $260 billion for 2022 alone. This is just to show you that by 2025, we'll have about 175, but you can see the explosion by 2035. And to make you understand in terms of terabytes, what is a zettabyte? Thanks, Verb. One zettabyte world would fill 500 million two terabyte hard disk at a current cost of 575 billion rand. So this is huge. The next thing that I would like to talk about is nanotechnology. And the reason that we're doing a lot of these new technologies and technologies that have existed previously but are only being applied now is we've got a lot of students and researchers. And this hopefully will give them ideas in terms of what to actually research on next. So nanotechnologies. What is nanotechnology? It's the science of manipulation of materials at an atomic, molecular, and macromolecular scale. To make you understand the size of a nanometer, if you take the size of a COVID-19 virus, it's about 80 nanometers. So you would need 750 COVID-19 viruses that could fit just into the width of one human hair. It's also the production and application of structures, devices, systems, by controlling the shape and size at nanometer dimensions. So this is just another picture to show you what nanometers really looks like. To give you another example, Gold and silver nanoparticles are used as colored pigments in stained glass and ceramics. Also, imaging techniques have improved our ability to control. The global spend is 6.25 billion. So this is something, and for the people that have been watching the news, there have been a couple of arrests made in the USA with trying to leak some of the nanotechnology research as well. The US has allocated $3.7 billion between 2005 and 2008. And the Japanese have funded $800 million in two 2003. I was asked the question, why haven't you got the latest figures, Sai? I think it's very confidential because no one is releasing latest figures. So if you Google this, you're not going to find any latest figures. Some of the other applications where nanotechnologies are used are in polymers, chemical processes, computer chips, DVD drives, enhanced data storage, and nano-engineered membranes that are used for energy efficient water purification and desalination. Another example is self-cleaning windows, which use a 50 nanometer thick coating of activated titanium oxide, engineered to be highly water repellent so that rainwater just flows off the surface, washing over, washing away the dirt. Some of nanoparticles are also used in sunscreens to reflect and to absorb ultraviolet light. Muliptinum, disulfate and titanium oxide catalysts are used for applications in energy storage. So what happens is MOS2 is a promising material for lithium ion batteries possessing superior charge storage capacity and cycling performance. And also nanocomposites such as lithium titanium oxide nanosheet arrays are decorated with MOS2 
and are synthesized by a hydrothermal approach. The importance of this is that these are the technologies, technologies that are also used in the batteries for drones. So there's a lot of interest around this particular application. The next advance that I'm going to be talking about is quantum computing. Although we might think that this is a fairly new concept, it was actually originating in the 60s. And although the concept originated in the 60s, the applications are fairly new. And there's a couple of applications that have been recent. So I'm just going to highlight on some of the high level discoveries in terms of quantum computing and where it's actually being used. So in the early 60s, uh, Stefan Wiesner invented conjugate code coding. So originally what he did was he started trying to make banknotes that you couldn't counterfeit. But then he wanted to have a way of secretly communicating quantum cryptography. So in 1982, he tried to publish a paper to the IEEE and the IEEE actually rejected it. However, the following year in 1983, they actually accepted the paper and this concept exploded. And then a decade later in 1993, he discovered quantum teleportation where he could actually transmit quantum information from one location to another. Until today, 2020, this still has not been implemented. So this is also an area where students can actually look at maybe a new invention. In 1970, the big uh, discovery was by Holino with regard to N qubits. So what is a qubit? So a qubit is made from electrons or nucleuses of a single phosphorus atom and is created inside a layer of silicon. So a qubit physical device behaves almost like a two-state quantum system. And I think it's not going to be so far out when we actually have a worldwide quantum cryptographic network, which is within reach with our current technology. And it is basically satellites based implementation. So you will have read in a lot of the news that a lot of the billionaires currently are investing in satellites mainly to uh, compound quantum computing. In 1980, Paul Benov discovered the laws of quantum mechanics and Yuri Mannion discovered uh, quantum computing, linking it back to the conjugate coding that Wiesner had actually discovered. And this was the main thing that contributed in the 1990s to quantum computers that were using superpositioning and entangle, entanglement to perform computation and to solve oracle problems, computational problems, and quantum databases. They also started discovering two to three qubits, and that brought about the discovery of nuclear magnetic resonance computer. In the 2000s, there was numerous discoveries. Some of them was the no cloning and no deleting theorems, single photon emitter for optic fibers, Six photon one-way quantum computers were created, nitrogen in a buckyball molecule used in quantum computing. The D wave systems were actually what was used in the NASA's quantum computers. And IBM built a 17 qubit in the early 2000s. In 2019, a 53 qubit quantum computer was uh, built. Artificial intelligence. So currently, we've got all the Tesla cars being built today with hardware necessary for self-drives, full self-drive. So they've got eight vision cameras, they've got 12 ultrasonic sensors, radars, and a full self-drive computer. You have data and computing, which has a major impact on disciplines like humanities, machine learning, and AI. And MIT has just announced a $1 billion plan to create a new college for AI. The president of MIT, Ralph, basically says that all students and researchers will be taught to use AI in the first disciplines from the first principles. And our own Professor Marwal, who is the vice chancellor of the University of Johannesburg, has emphasized on one of his recent articles that it was imperative for universities to teach AI to all students. You've now got a new concept that 
Uber is looking at and it's called Uber Elevate or Aerial Rides. And I'll be touching on this a little later as well in terms of pods at low pressure travel. And Tesla is also investing in a different uh, concept as well. And the UK alone is, especially the manufacturing division is investing 455 billion pounds. I'm going to be showing you again another video of how Ford and Domino have joined forces to have a collaboration with regard to a self-drive car. So if you can just hold while I quickly just show you this video, it's just loading. It's a scene that plays out in college towns across America. A student orders pizza and it's delivered a short time later. The difference here is that no one's driving this car. The Domino's heat wave container is open. At least that's what the pizza buyers believe. I just got a call after my order, like, your order will be delivered by a driverless car. I'm like, oh, exciting, I want to see that. <laughs> Domino's and Ford are teaming up to see if customers will warm to the idea of pizza delivered by autonomous vehicles. Delivery is a really important part of who we are, and autonomous vehicles are a technology that's coming. So it's really important that we understand how this new upcoming technology is going to impact our business in the future. Ford, which plans to introduce a fully driverless vehicle in 2021, Input the last four digits of your phone number. also wants to understand the kinds of scenarios for which companies would use it. The Domino's heat wave container is open. You can safely... So the automaker worked with Domino's to set up the experiment in the pizza company's hometown of Ann Arbor, Michigan sending out on deliveries a fusion hybrid autonomous research vehicle, complete with LIDAR, radar, and camera sensors. So moving on, I'm going to be touching briefly on humanoid robots. So, I'm going to be showing you a bionic cobot, which is an arm that is used in manufacturing. So this is what it looks like. It's got seven degrees of freedom and allows customers to customize what they require. And that's what all the fifth industrial revolution is about. It's about personalization. It's more the concept of what customers actually want. This is just more details in terms of what the arm actually looks like. I'm not going to be showing you a video on an avatar, which is called Neon. It's very short videos going forward now. These are not real people. This is Neon, a fully simulated digital avatar. It's kind of like a deep fake, but it's not. It could be an AI assistant, but it doesn't have to be. It's really in the early stages of development, and it's captured everyone's attention here at CES 2020. So we sat down in a tiny back room here at CES with the CEO of Neon to tell us a little bit more about what it is. Hi, I am Neon. I am an artificial human. I'm still learning about how humans talk, behave, and move. So just to go back, I think there was a bit of a problem with the cobot. So this is what the cobot looks like. It has seven degrees of freedom and allows customers to cost customize what they want. And this is the other picture of the cobot, just in case anyone missed it. So moving on, we have different kinds of robots. So you've got robot harvesters, in particular this one. So as you know, lettuce is quite a a delicate vegetable to actually pick because the head is quite sensitive. They've now developed actually a robot harvester that can pick up these lettuce heads without damaging them. And it also has been used now to do other vegetables as well. We've also got robot pickers, that's what they're called. So in particular with fruits, and the one that I'm showing you is one for apples. Okay, so Mercedes has recently come up with um, hologram exterior. 
And this basically is a, uh, shows you a concept car, which I'm going to show you now. So this is what it looks like. It's basically a photographic technique that records light scattered from the object. And they predict that they will start producing them by next year. So this is where they've got actually 33 movable scales, or they call them bionic fins or flaps. And supposedly it is to communicate with the driver, but I'm sure it's got a lot of other functionality as well. And now I'm going to show you another video on the humanoid Sophia. So I can't explain what she says, but obviously it's much better to see what she does. And um, a lot of my colleagues have told me they wouldn't date her. I don't know why. So just holding on while it just loads quickly. So now we're going to enter another set of questions, what I call the five things round of questions. So my first question to you is the following. What are the five things you love about the future? I'm very excited about technological advancements that will more closely couple humans and machines. Prosthetics, nano machines, and new forms of preventative medicine are very exciting. Who knows, maybe the research that goes into creating my body will be useful for similar applications. I'm also excited to see robots helping people with tasks that are dangerous or caring for those who can't live alone. What are the five things that you hate about the future? It always saddens me to think about violence and suffering. Wars, famines, natural disasters, poverty, homelessness, all weigh very heavily in my mind. Some of these issues are on the decline, but we cannot solve them fast enough. And what are the five things you're scared or afraid of the future? The more technology becomes autonomous, the greater caution people must take when designing it. I worry that humans sometimes tend to rush into things, so I would like to be someone who helps everyone realize that it is important to embed good ethics in the technology from the beginning, rather than trying to patch them up later. So that was Sophia. Moving on to supercomputers, which is my last advance that I'll be talking about um, at this stage. Supercomputers were originally built for scientific and engineering applications. They were basically uh, with regard to a large databases and a great um, uh, amount of computation. But Recently, with the COVID-19 crisis, speed was of the essence. So what they did is they brought in the supercomputers to help, specifically the one from NASA, as well as the one from IBM. So IBM supercomputer is actually called Summit, and it was commissioned by the US Department of Energy in 2014. It's housed in Oak Ridge at the National Labs in Tennessee. But for you to understand what the computers are actually doing with regard to the current virus. It's doing a lot of computational studies, frameworks and investigations to stop the virus, but how? So to make you understand, viruses infect the host cells by injecting them with a spike of genetic material. So Summit has to find a drug component that could actually bind to the spike and stop the spread. So what it does is it models the coronavirus spike and simulates how the atoms and particles in the viral protein react to the different compounds. So Summit ran simulations of over 8,000 components. And what happened was that they found 77 possible treatments of COVID-19, which they eventually ranked in, in order of importance. The other applications of supercomputers is to detect patterns in cellular system that precede Alzheimer's. It also analyzes genes that contribute to opioid addiction. It looks at climate simulations to predict extreme weather. And petaflop just uh, is the language that's used with supercomputers and it basically measures 
the computer processing speed to basically it's almost a quadrillion, 10 to the power of 15. So Summit has a, got about 220 petaflops and the NASA supercomputer has got about 330 petaflops. So float, flop is basically a floating point operation per second of speed. That's how they measure the speeds of these supercomputers. Of interest, especially to us electrical engineers, is how is artificial intelligence paving the way for virtual power plants? So countries such as Dubai, Australia, South Africa are involved in virtual power plants, also known as VPP. So what is a VPP? It is a smart network of decentralized medium scale generation units, such as solar photovoltaic, battery storage, wind farms, and flexible loads, which are linked and operated as a single centralized system. I'm going to be showing you a graphic design in terms of what it is actually. So in order to actually operate the individual units, you require a special algorithm, and this has to be controlled by an intelligent system. So the advanced technology uses artificial intelligence to enable integration of various types of energy into the smart grid. This gives rise to an opportunity to digitalize the energy sector through VPPs. And what it looks like is something like this, where you've basically got the decentralized energy producers, mainly the wind farms, the solar power, hydroelectric, bioenergy, and emergency power units. Then you have your consumers here, which could be your residential, your um, industrial, commercial, and this is not controllable. Then you have got your controllable power consumers and you have a trading system connection with external information, with a control center. So you need to have an intelligent system and algorithms to work out when you need to buy energy, when you need to sell, you're looking at market um, services, etc. So, how does this actually help with the current crisis that we have? And I think the reason we've got such a huge amount of registrations on the webinar is everyone's working from home. They've got a bit of time at least. So AI identifies, it tracks and forecasts the outbreaks. It's helping with the diagnosing of the virus. It's processing health claims in many of the countries. They are using drones to deliver medical supplies where they can't get to certain areas, and they're using robots to sterilize, deliver foods, and to do other tasks, especially if you have been tested or you're in a very serious state, then you don't want any contact with positive patients, so you could use robots in that case, and they are being used in many of the countries. It's obviously, as I explained with the supercomputers, it's helping to develop drugs and vaccines. It's also looking at the compliance of infected people. And especially in China, once you have tested positive, they can actually monitor all your phones to see where you are actually uh, going through. They've got thermal scanners at most of the entries and exits from the railway stations where they will scan you before you can go through. They're using facial recognition to track your movements. And they can use chatbots to share the information. So one of the things in South Africa that they're looking at obviously is tracking cell phone movements. And this is basically to make sure that if you have been tested positive or before you knew you were positive, that you could actually track all the people that you've been in contact with just by um, tracking either your cell phone or through various other algorithms that they can use. In China alone, there's 200 million cameras that are using facial recognition to actually track um, everyone's movements in terms of, in particular now, the COVID-19. So obviously all this technology has its risks as well. Firstly, you have global economies which will be impacted with a surge of smart technologies. You have skills shortage currently for the fourth industrial revolution. How are we going to deal with it for the fifth industrial revolution? At this stage, we've got a limited few that understand and will be able to use AI, supercomputers, etc. We're going to have a huge unemployment risk in that, as we've seen, a lot of companies are now installing robots and displacing jobs. 
We've got Android, Android robots that are doing a lot of the work that we are doing now. The volumes are exploding and the robots density are also exploding and we are increasing productivity through the ro robots, which is a risk. Three print, 3D printers can now make it easy for anyone to create useful parts and objects immediately. Are these actually controlled? There's huge ethical concerns and legal implications in terms of, like I mentioned, they can now monitor you through facial recognition. They could use drones to track you. Um, if a bot causes a power failure, do we, do we actually have legal implications against the company that developed the bot or is it the bot's problem that caused the power failure? So there's a lot of legal implications as well uh, with regard to this. Furthermore, the biggest challenge that a lot of the AI programmers are looking at is, can our machines be self-aware? Once our machines are designed to start feeling, thinking and doing for, for themselves, um, will they be let loose and will we be able to still control them? What will future jobs look like? Are we going to have societal problems and challenges? I think we already do have some of this in terms of our kids nowadays that are hooked onto um, cell phones, programming, et cetera. What can go wrong with these machines? So if a program goes wrong or an algorithm goes wrong, can we have a right over button that can actually mute the bot or the drone? How do we offer labor to an economy that's full of machines? In the next two years, the robots will not take over all our jobs, but as time passes on, and the technical world advances while labor decreases, we're going to have radical interventions where we might have to look at a minimum income guarantee or other issues that we might be faced with then. So what does the future hold? Artificial intelligence is bringing different disciplines together. We have researchers from cognitive science, neuroscience, as well as computer science. By 2021, we'll have robots and automation. Bill Gates said by 2021, we'll have AI assistants that predict uh, what we need and are trained to create conversation and not just obey commands. By 2022, we'll have robot dexterity, which is robots can anticipate human needs. You get home and the robot is ready with a cold beer. By 2023, we'll have supercomputers in our pockets. You look at Uber Aerial, that's at a high level of production at this stage. I mean, they've invested a couple of billion rand at the moment into flying cars, which we think at this stage is fiction, but um, companies like Tesla and Amazon are all looking at these options now. You look at low pressure pods, you're looking at loop travel, and these are already being looked at in cities like California, Los Angeles, and Texas. The global robotics market is predicted to reach $500 billion by 2025. So if you're thinking of what kind of a job you need to be into, I think definitely robotics and AI. Agriculture, they're looking at drones and robots, in particular between 2.5 to 23 billion in 2028. Agriculture alone is a huge market in which farmers can use drones and AI to look at moisture content, rainfall patterns, weather extremes, and make sure that their stock or crops are looked after. We actually had a presentation before the lockdown about three weeks before we locked down with regard to drones and agriculture. And it was actually quite amazing the applications that they have within the agricultural um, departments. In 2030, computers will be more intelligent than humans machine learning will be common. So in conclusion, the fourth industrial revolution is here, but the fifth industrial revolution will be a rapid acceleration. It will be an exponential growth curve and exponentially accelerating technology, which is also known as convergence. The future is faster than you think and most of us can handle. In fact, there's a book, and thanks Manda for that. It's called The Future is Faster Than You Think, 
and it's written by Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler. So if you have an uh, opportunity, please read it. It actually covers quite a bit in terms of what the future holds. Rapid change in AI, health, autonomous and electric cars, education, 3D printing, how we do agriculture does require evolving jobs. Software has disrupted and will continue to disrupt most traditional industries in the next five to 10 years. Just like I said, Uber, Airbnb and Kodak. I mean, these are things of the past already. We're looking at Uber Aerial. Will artificial intelligence be self-aware or conscious? And this is the big challenge that currently AI is looking at and has advanced dramatically in. SAIE would like to encourage entrepreneurship and develop the appropriate skills to address what is coming in the future. There are endless possibilities for the SAIE and the engineering sector as a whole to apply AI, robotics, IoT, big data, automation, smart systems, machine learning towards a better world for all in the future. And we hope that as many people as possible get engaged with the SAI in terms of this particular chapter that we should be launching soon as well. So I thank you and I hope you make sure you control the technology and you don't let the technology control you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Sai Guru, for the most enlightening and stimulating presentation and for all the technology to work well this morning. So I'm going to pass on to our host, uh, Mr. Leonetsi Machuchuane, who will basically, uh, hopefully, you have sent your questions via the chat process, and he will um, read the questions to President Saigura, and then she will um, and uh, try and respond to them. We kind of exceeded our time, so we'll leave a few minutes for the most pressing questions that we have, and the others we can do offline. So, Leonetsi. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, President, uh, I have a question here from Andre Hoffman. It goes as follows. Has any research been done on the impact of these nanoparticles on the environment as they may end up in the air or oceans? Okay, if I can respond to that particular one, uh, nanotechnology is a huge market at this stage. Unfortunately, a lot of the research is quite secretive and the governments are not prepared to release a lot of this research. And I don't know if you're aware that they even had an arrest in the US recently for some of the leaked research. So um, I would be able to maybe have a look at this and see if there is some research with regard to that. But I, at this stage, I'm not sure if there has been any research with regard to releasing the nanoparticles into the atmosphere. Thank you, President. The next one is from Andre Young. It says, please Sai, indicate what the shift in consciousness, which is awareness and response, you think is required politically, economically, socially, environmentally, and legally across the globe. The current stuckness of thinking is preventing the rapid adoption and adaption of the fifth industrial revolution for the benefit of mankind. Thanks, Andre, for that question. And uh, I think you're quite right in that we need a complete shift. And especially if we can start with our youngsters. And I think I'd like to compliment Professor Marwal, especially for saying it's eminent that we actually teach all our kids today to, to use AI from the first principles. What I'd like to compliment, though, is our president, who has recently set up a commission in terms of the 4IR, which is also headed by Professor Marwal. So I think politically there has been a slow change in terms of trying to change the way we look at um, the, in, the industrial revolution. So once we've got grips with the fourth industrial revolution, I think we would be ready for the fifth industrial revolution. But I think particularly in South Africa, what is lacking is us and our readiness in terms of the people that need to have the skills to actually have this particular skill. So it's a long road ahead. And I think with people like you, we should be able to get the political buy-ins. And also it would be a huge boost in terms of our economy in South Africa. Thank you. President, I have another one here from Loxley Ross. 
it asks how far are we as South Africa in regards to the fourth industrial revolution in terms of skills shortage and training? Thanks, Mr. Ross, for that question. I think I partially answered that is the president has set up a commission commission with the fourth, fourth industrial revolution. And it's basically the experts from the industry in South Africa that are sitting on that particular commission. So in terms of skills, I think we're still way behind with regard to the skills that we require. So that is where in terms of the universities, we need to actually start looking at universities teaching these principles and a whole mind shift change in terms of our curriculum we can't be still and i'm glad we have a lot of academia with the saie we need to look at a whole change in terms of the curriculum to look at um, coding we need to look at robotics ai and we do have this in some of the universities but i think a lot of people are scared to go into this field and this is something that we need to look into President, the next one is more of a comment from Musehe Fenger. It says, thanks, President. Very informative presentation. I really enjoyed listening to your address. The next question is from Muhammad Voraji. It, he asks as follows. On the weaponry video, he says, enough to kill half a city, the bad half. That video was actually very scary. We as engineers need to make an effort to learn how to be human and have a good moral code so that this technology is not used to help people, is not used to help people, not kill them. We want build, to build nations and assist nations, not destroy nations. Something to think about is we train ourselves and the next generation of engineers. Are you done, Lynette? I'm trying to get the rest of it and I cannot see. So um, just your comment, maybe, President. Okay, thanks for that one comment in between. And then coming to your question, Mohammed, I think that is indeed a very scary video. And thank goodness it's a concept uh, video and not an actual video at this stage. But I think with any kind of technology, and I did cover that under my ethical risk, is that we as engineers are bound by a code of conduct, especially as members and professional engineers of EXA, the Engineering Council of South Africa, to do the moral thing and to be ethical. However, we are all aware that not everyone is going to be ethical. So in the same uh, breath where we are manufacturing these dangers, we're going to have to have people that are able to compact the negative that comes through. So you'll have, for example, guys that are trained to do anti-hacking in banks. It will be similar with the drones as well. So like you said, it's one of the topics that we're currently teaching in universities actually is uh, ethics. And I think it's something that engineers need to abide with. But the scary thing is I don't think it's the engineers that have the money to buy those big uh, swan of drones. It will be somebody else. <laughs> President, the next one is from Veer Ramnarain. He asks, how will engineering institutions like SAIE keep traditional engineers ahead of the revolution, or at least prepare them for the revolution? Uh, thanks, Veer, for the question. And indeed, when I was researching this topic, it was an entire eye-opener to actually let me know how outdated I am. And maybe, you know, I kept thinking Sophia the bot was interesting until I started looking at supercomputers and nanotechnologies. And I consider myself older this age, but I think it's something that we need to start adapting to and start finding opportunities to enrich and teach ourselves in terms of what is supercomputers? Where can we get into these particular fields? And I think it's something that I would like to take offline with the powers B to see how we existing engineers can actually get into some of these areas of expertise and try and build the country, especially South Africa. I mean, we're way behind in terms of the BRICS countries that are way advanced with these particular technologies. Thank you, President. 
Uh, next one, the comment from David, who has since left, David Levin. He says, thanks very much. Fantastic, well done presentation. Next question is from Brendan Ormond. He asks, will South Africa be able to keep up with the current transformations due to the mass difference of availability and access from the rural and urban areas? And how would we cope with the mass transformation of 5IR? I think currently it is a challenge, especially in the rural areas. And this is something that the 4IR Commission is actually currently dealing with. We need a complete rollout in terms of the networks to all areas of South Africa in particular. And I think the other big problem is the bandwidth, which is being looked at at the stage. So those are the two things that I think that are hurdles for us actually exploding in terms of um, learning more about 4IR or 5IR for this stage. So it is a challenge at this stage, but it's something that we hopefully will overcome soon. President, the next question is from Sobuza Chobeni. He asks, what developments are there in terms of regulating these technologies? Are governments worldwide following these technological developments? Thanks for that question, Sombuza. Sombuza. Um, you could see under my risk, I did put a legal risk. And I think it also covers regulations because one of the big problems is how are we going to regulate the flight of drones? And I know there's new regulation in South Africa that's just been released with regard to drones. But one of the things stopping actually Tesla and the Uber aerial is particular regulations in terms of the FAA, which is the flight uh, guys, et cetera, because once you have flying cars, how are you actually going to regulate these cars? So already in the US, they are looking at different options in terms of regulating this. But as there's explosion in the technologies, you have to develop the regulation. So unfortunately, it's not the regulations first and then the technology. Due to the rapid explosion, it's the technology first and then the regulation is kind of uh, following thereafter. So it is lagging at this stage, but I think we are catching up in different countries in terms of the regulations. President, uh, due to time constraints, I'm going to give you two last questions and then we'll leave it at that. The first one is from David Tarrant and it goes as follows. President, what is your opinion on the specific risks in South Africa AI brings to the labor or semi-skilled market? And how will the trade unions respond? I think in particular, that's the reason why I've actually shown one of the first slides is to say that originally, I think 82% of South Africans were willing to actually engage with robotics and AI. But I think the more we start installing robotics into the factories and, and then into the environment, and there's a higher density of the robot workers, I think our labor is definitely going to be disturbed. And with any new change or transformation, there's always labor issues. So we will have to engage going forward with the labor unions, et cetera, to find a fine balance. And I think that's where I would like to encourage our youngsters that are coming up to actually look at the new technologies and see where they need to be studying and researching. So that instead of having skills that we no longer require. We have skills and a, a pool of skills that we do require for this big transformation. So that way we could counter not having jobs for the normal jobs that robots can do, but you have jobs for people to program, people to code, people to research, people to find vaccines. So you have a total shift in terms of the jobs that are actually required. And that's why I also mentioned evolving jobs because we now need to look at the jobs that are actually required with the technology that is advancing. Thank you, President. And the last one here is from Sietzele Sietzwan. It goes as follows. Practically, what is the SAIEE doing or planning to do to help build an ecosystem that will allow the fourth industrial revolution or the fifth industrial revolution to thrive? Thanks for that question. Um, normally, every president has a theme, and I was trying battling actually to find a theme. But when I was doing this presentation, the one thing that came to light is that 
we have a particular chapter or a particular section in the SAI that has been dormant and that will be addressing a lot of um, the fifth industrial revolution or the fourth industrial revolution. So I think that is something that we need to ignite and something that we need to bring forth. And it's a chapter that actually deals quite a bit in terms of artificial intelligence, robotics, and we need to maybe expand and look at data explosion, nanotechnologies, supercomputers. So we do have people in South Africa that have these expertise. And I think it's one area that we need to start exploding on as well. So it'll definitely be something that I'll be looking into. Okay. President has mentioned over to you, uh, Deputy President. Thank you, Linetsi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Um, so it's for me to just do the vote of thanks and then pass on to you as, as chair and president. First of all, I'd like to thank you very much for the time and efforts you put into preparing and doing the research. And of course, putting this, integrating this presentation, as you know, it's not a trivial activity to plan, to prepare, to execute, and finally implement and integrate the technology and the ideas and the concepts. And well done to you and to the team. I also like to thank the SAIE operations team from the CEO, the operations, chief operations manager officer and others for putting this together and uh, having a success, a successful uh, presentation with the technology and the ideas and the concepts and of course the different uh, stakeholders involvement and of course to the attendees we had an all-time record of attendees today um, thank you very much from from uh, afar to make the time to listen and to share your knowledge and to also um, give your comments um, I now pass on to Madam President to uh, say the concluding remarks and close today's event. Thank you, Deputy President, Professor Sunil Maharaj. Uh, thank you especially to everyone that has joined us on this webinar. Indeed, we had a record of 205 attendees. And I'd like to thank you once again for joining this webinar and thank you to everyone that helped behind the scenes to make sure the technology worked today. Our bandwidths were fine. It was a lot of dry runs. I'd like to thank especially everyone that uh, stood in through the dry runs to make this a success. In parting, I'd just like to ask you all to take care with the current virus that we have. Please obey the lockdowns. It is for your own safety. Wash your hands, sanitize, and go out only if it's essential. Uh, wear a mask, be safe, and until the next time, I thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>